Good morning, everyone. You can take the message outline from your bulletin. We are looking at the six stages of loss and grief that I've adapted from the Kubler-Ross model. The stages are shock, sorrow, struggle, surrender, sanctification, <clears throat> and service. This message is going to focus on the third stage, struggle. I want to begin with a statement that is universally true. All of life is a struggle because everything in the world is broken. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they opened the door to a lot of bad things. So in Genesis 3.17, it says, Because you sinned all your life, you will struggle. Now, no one needs to tell you the truth of that verse because you already know it by personal experience. We struggle three ways with other people, with ourselves, and with God. And we're going to talk about struggle as it is illustrated in the life of Jacob. In other words, in Jacob, we are going to see our own personal struggles. So first, we struggle with other people. <clears throat> Every relationship is broken because of sin. And so there is misunderstanding and conflict. We get disappointed in other people, and other people get disappointed in us. <clears throat> Jacob is an example of a person who struggled his entire life. Now you can see some of these on the outline. <clears throat> he struggled with his twin brother Esau, and stole the birthright and blessing. He struggled with his two wives, Leah and Rachel, and his handmaids, Billa and Zilpha. Read Genesis 30 sometime and see the negative aspects of polygamy. Now I'm aware of the TV show series, Sister Wives, where the fella is married to four women. But even in that arrangement, it still is not ideal or perfect. And the reason why I mentioned Sister Wives, this is the TV show, is because our society loves to parade in front of us relationships that are outside of the biblical norm. TV. They love it. Hey, take a look at this combination of human beings. Okay, I get it. Jacob struggled with his in-laws. He struggled with God. He struggled with his 12 sons. It was a very dysfunctional family because of favoritism and four mothers trying to live under the same roof. So we struggle with other people. And then, in the second place, we struggle with others. Well, excuse me, we struggle with ourselves. Jacob struggled with insecurities and manipulating other people. Jacob's life is a good illustration that the biggest battle we fight isn't with other people, it's with ourselves. You struggle with your fears, your flaws, your temptations, guilt, regret, addictions. In Romans 7, Paul describes the kind of struggle we have with ourselves as he describes himself before he became a Christian. This is Romans 7, verse 15. I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do everything I hate. No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, 
but I can't. But there is a law at work within me that is at war with my mind. We all identify with that passage. We want to do what is right, but often end up doing what is wrong because we struggle with ourselves. <clears throat> and then in the third place, we struggle with God, and we're going to spend most of our time on this one, and I'll tell you why. Many of the struggles we have with other people and with ourselves is rooted in our struggle with God. And we struggle with God for two reasons. We doubt His wisdom, and therefore, we want to be in control. We think we know what will make us happy more than God. Now, you may have never doubted your parents' love, but you may have doubted their wisdom. And it's that way with God. We don't doubt His love for us, but we often doubt His wisdom which is why we ask questions like, why is this happening, happening to me? Or why do my prayers go unanswered? We're not doubting His love, just doubting His wisdom. Jacob illustrates our struggle with God. In Hosea 12.3, in Hosea, this was written about a thousand years after Jacob. In the womb, he grasped his brother's heel <laughs> as a man. He struggled with God. So even before Jacob was born, he struggled in the womb. And then later in life, he had a literal wrestling match with God in Genesis 32. Now, we're not talking about fake wrestling that's on TV. That's for entertainment purposes. But he had a real, literal, physical wrestling match with God. So here's the background. Jacob has cheated his twin brother Esau out of his birthright and blessing. And perhaps understandably so, Esau wants to kill Jacob. I'm going to kill you. So Jacob runs. This is Jacob running. And he runs. And he goes to another country. And he marries his uncle's daughters, Leah and Rachel. Okay, there was a little bit of a marital mix-up. The morning after the wedding, he's supposed to marry Rachel. The morning after the wedding, he's rolling over to kiss his new wife, good morning. And it's the other sister, it's the wrong one, it's Leah. And you know what was so tragic about that story? She was the ugly one. <laughs> you know, if you were going to marry the, the ugly sister, but you woke up in the morning and the younger, more beautiful sister was next to you, it maybe would be so tragic. <laughs> the Bible says she was ugly. The Holy Spirit said her eyes would make you weak. <laughs> True. That's God's way of saying a person was ugly. So there's a little bit of a marital mix-up that had to be worked out. Well, after many, many years, Jacob decides to return to his home country. He is a very wealthy man now. And on the return journey, he hears that his brother Esau is coming out to meet up with 400 armed men. And Jacob is scared to death. So he splits his family up into different groups so they won't get hurt. And that night, he has an encounter with God that will change his life. So in Genesis 32, 24, so Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. 
So Jacob meets a man, clearly an angel, and wrestles until daybreak. When the man saw that he was not winning the struggle, he hit Jacob on the hip, and it was thrown out of joint. The man said, let me go. Daylight is coming. I won't unless you bless me. Jacob answered. It says the man, the angel, was not winning the struggle. <clears throat> so let me ask you this question. Have you ever been in a no-win struggle? Have you ever been there? There are some things in your life that are never going to change. And there are some problems that you deal with on a daily basis that you will be struggling with the rest of your life. Amen. It was Solomon who said in Ecclesiastes, the book that shows life, how it really is, that the crooked cannot be made straight. There are some crooked things in your life that are never going to be straightened. And so this man, or angel, representing God, could have instantly beat Jacob. I mean, it's an angel for crying out loud. But God allows the struggle to continue to attack, to teach Jacob some lessons. Because we learn lessons in the struggles of life. Now this is going to sound very strange. But God loves it when you struggle with Him through your questions and problems because He has your attention and you're not going to walk away. And God would rather fight with you than have you flee. And Jacob's encounter with God changes his life. So let me say something about wrestling because this is a wrestling match. I'm going to use the word intimate, but I don't mean it in any kind of a sexual connotation. Wrestling is probably the most intimate sport there is. Now, I'm not talking about the fake stuff on TV. I'm talking about college and the Olympics, the Greco-Roman wrestling. In tennis, everybody has their side of the net. You stay on your side, I'll stay on my side. In swimming, everybody has their own lane. Stay in your lane. In wrestling, you're almost kissing the guy. You're breathing all over him and have your arms and legs all wrapped around him like a snake around a pole. It's an intimate sport. Because I wrestled in high school on the B team. Our matches didn't count but there was never any pressure on me, therefore, to win. That's how I looked at it. So in verse 30, Jacob named the place Peniel, face of God, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. So Jacob had an intimate face to face encounter with God, and then the man asked him, what is your name? Now, anytime the Bible asks a rhetorical question, it's not about the rhetorical question. When God asked Adam, where are you? Well, I kind of think God knew where Adam was. Don't you think he did? Adam should have responded, I'm in, I'm in sin. Now, he should have responded. So this isn't about his name. It's about what his name means. So the man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. The men man said, your name is no longer going to be Jacob, but Israel, because you struggled with God and men and have overcome. So what in the world is going on in this rather bizarre story? God wants Jacob to admit who he is. Back in those days, names often represented your character. And the word Jacob means deceiver or manipulator. 
and Jacob has been deceiving and manipulating people his entire life, his brother, his uncle, his wives, his children. So when God asked him his name, he's trying to get Jacob to admit he's the problem. God is saying, you are a deceiver and a manipulator, and you need to see yourself as you really are, Jacob. So I have a personal question to ask you. What would your name be if you were named after your primary sin? What would your name be? Greedy? Hello, Mr. Greedy. Lustful? Gossip? Lazy? Angry? God is asking Jacob to admit who he is because until you admit who you are, nothing is changing in your life. Amen. Not a single thing is going to change. Verse 28, your name will no longer be Jacob, no longer deceiver, no longer manipulator. It is now Israel. Because you have struggled with both God and men and have won. So Jacob struggles and he admits who he is. And he gets a new name, a new identity, and a new blessing. Israel means a couple of things. It depends on how the scholars interpret the root Hebrew word. It means one who struggles with God. It can mean prince of God. So the Lord is saying, Jacob, you used to be a manipulator and a deceiver, but now you are a prince. You are a leader. Jacob's struggle with God changed his perspective about himself and made him a better person. So what are you and I supposed to get out of this odd story? God is working through your struggles to get you to see who you are, who you really are, and admit who you really are. So you can change and become a more mature believer. Maybe you're angry at God. Maybe you're disappointed with God. Maybe you feel like God has let you down. Maybe you feel like your prayers aren't being answered. These issues are causing you to struggle with God, but in that struggle, you are learning that the Lord cares for you, loves you, and wants you to be more mature. That's why He allows the struggles in the first place. So in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about what happens to you. So in this next section, how to wrestle with God and win, and of course I put wrestle in quotation marks, I put win in quotation marks, we're really not talking about a physical wrestling match, we're really not talking about winning or losing. The, the subtitle really explains the main title, Finding Strength Through the Prayer of lament. Last week we talked about lament prayers and we defined lament. We said lament is a passionate complaint to God. It's passionate. It's, oh Lord, why is all this going on? And there's a book called Lamentation. Out of the 150 individual psalms that make up the book of psalms, 65 are laments or complaints to God. And what is interesting is in these lament psalms, there is a pattern that if we follow it, it will allow us to ultimately grow because of our struggles. So we'll look at these under the acronym of CARE. C-A-R-E. Let me list them. And then we'll talk about them. 
C is when you complain about what is bothering you. You lament. And it is okay to complain. People in the Bible usually complain in question form. Lord, why don't you do something? Lord, why is this happening to me? Lord, how come there is no justice in my life? A is you appeal to God's nature. R is you remind God of any promises He's made. Is there a promise that you can attach to whatever you're asking God? And E is express trust in God's wisdom in the things I don't understand. So number one, complain to God about what you think is unfair or painful. Complain to God about what you think is unfair or painful. So let me illustrate this by reading a few selected passages. This first one is out of Job 13, and I have taken, if you can read that font, you have better than 2020 vision. You have like 20, 2010 vision or something, okay? This is Job 13, beginning of verse 14. This is Job. I've lost all hope, so what if God kills me? I am going to state my case to him. Now listen to my words of explanation. I am ready to state my case because I know I am in the right. I am coming to, are you coming to accuse me, God? Speak first, O oh God, and I will answer. Oh, let me speak and you answer. What are my sins? What wrongs have I done? What crimes am I charged with? Why do you avoid me? Why do you treat me like an enemy? Are you trying to frighten me? I'm nothing but a leaf. You are attacking a piece of straw. Now here's the beautiful thing. This prayer of lament or complaint, God was totally okay with it. He was totally okay with it. At the end of the book, God said, my Joe, my friend Joe, he said the things right about me. He said things right about me. God's okay with you complaining. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that. Look at what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah, he was a big time prophet, right? Well, he had 52 chapters in his book. See, I determine the importance of a prophet by how long their books are. <laughs> Obadiah wasn't a big prophet. It only has like uh, 25 verses. Here's Jeremiah. Lord, if I argued my case with you, you'd prove me, you'd prove to be right. Yet still I must question you about matters of justice. Why are the wicked so prosperous? Why do dishonest people succeed? I think we're still asking these questions today. They don't really care about you. But, Lord, you know me. You see what I do. And you know how I love you. How long will our land be dry? Animals and birds are dying because of the wickedness of our people who think you don't really see what you're doing. Do you hear the complaining in his voice? Do you hear the lament? So there's two keys in praying to God when you struggle. A couple of things to be aware of. Number one is complain. <laughs> I don't mean for this to be humorous. Complain to God, not about God. The Jewish nation complained about God and got stuck in the desert for 40 years. Moses complained to God. And the Lord said, well, I'll think about that. I'll listen to that. Second thing is complain in faith, believing God is listening. Then you're going to love this next passage. This is a great passage. Psalm 55, 17. Morning, noon, and night, my complaints and groans go up to him, and he will hear my voice. You know what's beautiful? Get this. David is complaining three times a day. It's time for the noon prayer. Okay, Lord, what's going on around here? Three times a day he's complaining. And yet the Bible, the book of Acts, calls David, ready for this, a man after God's own heart. You want to know one of the reasons why David was a man after God's own heart? He complained three times a day. 
And he was regular about it. Maybe the Lord appreciated the habit of three times a day. So you don't always have to have these prayers and everything. Oh, it's all flowers today, Lord. It's all beautiful, beautiful yellow flowers. He's complaining three times a day, according to this passage. Second thing is appeal to God's nature. Appeal to God's nature. You can pray and complain and lament about what you don't like. And there's a lot of stuff in the world not to like. But at the same time, you can appeal to God's nature. So this is beautiful in Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me? Forever. How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with the sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, my God. I trust your unfailing love. Look at Look at the change at the end. Did you see the quick change at the end? He has this long laundry list of stuff that isn't right, but at the end he says, I trust in your unfailing love. That's great. That is a pattern for us to follow. <clears throat> so you can spend about 90% of your prayer complaining about what you don't like. Then at the very end, say, but I'm going to trust in your unfailing love. That's how God is okay with that. David complained morning, noon, and night. The third thing is, this is going to sound strange, remind God of what he said. That's right. Remind God of what he has promised in his word. Did you know that God absolutely loves to be reminded of his promises? He loves it. So it's kind of like when your kids were small. Small, here, small, here, your kids. Your kids are small. And what do they do when they're small? They come up to you. They say, oh, you have to take us to Disney World. <coughs> we have to go to Disney World. And you, and you, as a parent, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll take you to Disney World. But you never get around to it because you're busy. Well, a few months later or a year later, they come up to you again, your kids, because they're pretty smart and they're like big sponges. They take everything in. And they come up to you like a year later and say, hey, when are we going to Disney World? Well, uh, you promise. And you know what happens? You take them to Disney World because you don't want your kids growing up believing that their parents were liars. So it's okay to remind God. Look at how Jacob reminds God. Twice, Jacob says, uh, <clears throat> Lord, I just want to remind you, you promised. You know, I, I, know, I know Esau is coming to kill me with 400 armed men. Look at this. Genesis 32, verse 9. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac, O Lord, you told me to return to my land and to my relatives. And you promised, I'm just reminding you, Lord, and you promised to treat me kindly. Lord, please rescue me from my brother Esau. I'm afraid he's coming to kill me. You promised to treat me kindly and to multiply my descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore, too many to count. Jacob is asking, Lord, if my brother kills me, how am I going to be the father of a great nation? See the little reminders in there? The little hints in there. So you can remind God. Remind God of some of the promises you know about. Or you can go buy that book, All the Promises Up in the Bible. It was like a long time ago, I don't know, maybe 1970s, Herbert Lockler, Lockler or something. It's like all the promises of the Bible. You can just go through that thing. That'll help you to know what they are. Four is express total trust in God. Total, express, total trust in God. Express, that's the E in care. Express total trust in God. This is great. This is Job 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. 
but I will maintain my own ways before him. Well, that is just great. Let me tell you, Job knew a whole lot less about the afterlife than we do in the New Testament era. He didn't know that much. We know more. And this guy, all ten of his children are dead. His possessions are in foreign lands. And his health has gone completely kaput. And he says, Lord, though you kill me, you may kill me, but I'm going to continue to trust in you. What a great attitude. The ultimate expression of trust has to be the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Interesting. Just a three-chapter book. You can read it in probably less than 30 minutes. Habakkuk. So here's what's going on in Habakkuk. I'm sure on a Saturday night you just love pulling out your personal copy of Habakkuk. God says, I've got some really big plans. Habakkuk says, tell me those plans. I'd like to know those plans. Lord says, I can't take it. Habakkuk says, why can't you tell me? Lord says, if I tell you what I'm about to do, you are not going to believe me. And Habakkuk, Habakkuk says, you can tell me, Lord, I'm one of your prophets. God, I don't know. Habakkuk says, God, tell me. So God says, okay, here's what I'm doing. This is my plan. I'm going to use the more wicked nation Babylon to destroy the less wicked Jewish nation, and then I'm going to destroy Babylon for destroying you. And Habakkuk says, I don't believe <laughs> So he comes to the end of the book. This is great when you understand their agricultural community. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms, that would not be very good if you were a fig tree farmer. And there are no grapes on the vine. No Welch's grape juice for communion. <laughs> Even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and bare. And even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, this is great. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. So the way you win a fight with God is you surrender. And that's what we're going to talk about next week in stage four, how to surrender as we look at the surrender of King David in the death of his child. Remember David and Bathsheba? Have that child, child die. That story, we're going to see the power of surrender. You have to surrender all of your unanswered questions and say, Lord, even though I don't understand, I'm still going to love you and trust you. So the story of Jacob concludes, this is verse 31. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. During the wrestling match, God dislocated Jacob's hip socket. So I want to say a couple of things about it. First, literal and then metaphorical. Literally, the hip muscle is one of the strongest muscles in the body. God touched him and made him weak at the point of greatest strength so that he will limp the rest of his life as a reminder to depend on God. Jacob has spent all his life running, running from people, running here, running there. Now, no more running. And as he walks with this limb, I don't know how severe it was, <coughs> he's going to be reminded to depend on God every step of the way. Metaphorically, 
We all have lips to remind us to depend on the Lord. Your lip may be a financial crisis that you have never recovered from. Your lip may be a divorce or a loss of a family member or a health problem or you dropped out of school or you went to jail. All of these limps remind you symbolically to depend on God and not yourself. So I'd like to conclude and close with a prayer and it's on the outline. If you'll bow with me. Father, you know all the things I struggle with. My fears, my weaknesses, my relationships, my regrets, my addictions, compulsions, and temptations. I realize that all of my life struggles are really rooted in my struggle with you. I have doubted your wisdom. Like Jacob, I have tried to manipulate things to feel more secure and in control. I realize your blessings come not from my efforts and trying harder, but in surrendering to you the things I don't understand and can't control. Thank you for being a good God. Teach me how to pray the prayer of lament. I'm grateful you care. You tell me to cast my worries on you because you care for me. I give myself to you and understand that life's struggles can make my faith deeper and more secure. I give myself to you 100%. The good, the bad, and the other. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you have a need, let us know what it is while we stand and sing.